I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. You'd be hard-pressed to fit that on your mantelpiece, wouldn't you? But that's the whole thing about Melbourne. There is so much space. Space for huge artworks like that, space for the rich kids to play with their boats on a Saturday morning, places for wheeler dealing, insurance companies, hotels. It's a symphony of 21st century global capitalism. Really interesting. Well, actually, it's not that interesting. What I find far more intriguing are all the little lanes, the, the byways and alleys that are dripping with history. And that is what we're going to have a look at. You coming or what? walk around Australia. Ah, Melbourne. It's such a prim and proper city. Not. I'll be having a beer with a naked lady. I can't believe that. Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an infamous street gang from the 1970s. I won't tell them I used to be a mob, they'll kill me. <laughs> and reliving a siege that's less Martin Scorsese... Bang, bang, bang! ..and more Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. This is the tiny little alleyway I was talking about. It's called Hosier Lane, and it's your bog-standard mid-19th-century Melbourne Lane with the cobbles running all the way down it. Except this lane is one of the most photographed spots in the whole of Melbourne. Why? Well, look at this. The whole place is a hymn to street art. Look at this lovely Ganesh. It's been up over a year, and it's hardly been sprayed over at all, so obviously people are treating it with quite a deal of respect. My favourite bit is this cute little mouse at the bottom of it. I've heard of the celebrated artist Banksy, but frankly, I wouldn't know a black Lorat or a Wachavato or an elk if one was sprayed all over me. Still, look hard enough and you'll find them all here. I feel so conflicted about this stuff. There's part of me that thinks it's really vibrant, exciting, so real, and yet you can't deny it. there's part of it which is just about trashing people's property. But Banksy says, and he should know, that Melbourne is the, the capital of street art throughout the world. If there's one thing more than any other that demonstrates the transitory nature of street art, it's got to be right at the front of this lorry. <coughs> oh, but you're all right. <laughs> look, have a look here. There's nothing, is there? Well, actually, there are four bolts here. The reason is that there used to be a Banksy sprayed onto this, but the owners of the building realised that it was quite valuable, so they fixed perspex over it in order to protect it. And then somebody came along with a tin of paint and tipped it down behind the perspex, wiped out the Banksy, and then sprayed the words, Banksy was here, over it. Which I reckon Banksy himself probably quite appreciated. Controversial art isn't anything new around here, but back in the 19th century, it wasn't spray cans, it was a gorgeous French woman who had tongues wagging. What was the fuss all about? Well, here she is, Chloe, in all her naked glory. Isn't she fantastic? There is, I think, something a bit odd about this arm going on, but apart from that, it's such a delightful picture. 
So why was she controversial? Well, Chloe was part of an exhibition of European art on show at the big gallery in town, which was open to the general public. It wasn't that the artistic elite of Melbourne thought that they shouldn't be allowed to see her because, of course, they would be inspired and ennobled by all this loveliness. What concerned them was working-class people having a look at that. What on earth would it inflame them to do? Dreadful things. But anyway, the whole thing only lasted about three weeks and then, sadly, they had to close the exhibition down. And that was that, until the year 1908. There was this ex-gold digger entrepreneur called Henry Figsby Young who bought this pub, renamed it the Young and Jackson Hotel. He acquired Chloe for 800 quid. I'd buy her for 800 quid, wouldn't you? He put her up on the wall and she's been here ever since. Megan, do people still come here just to have a look at her? Yeah, they come every day. Was there a real Chloe? It was not a real Chloe, but there was a model that sat for Chloe. Uh, her name was Marie. She was a French artist model. Um, she, uh, she was 19 when she was painted, but at 21, um, apparently having fallen in love with the artist, at her 21st birthday, she boiled up a concoction of sulfur matches, drank the concoction and died. Why did she do that? Unrequited love. Apparently she'd fallen for the artist Jules Lefebvre. He'd announced his uh, engagement to her sister, whose name was ironically Chloe, and she was just devastated. Oh, I can't believe that. I can't believe it. I mean, either, you wouldn't but... turn down somebody <laughs> like that, would you? How could you? Well, I'll finish my pint quietly at the bar, which will give you guys time to have another look at Chloe. Street Railway Station, the oldest in the Southern Hemisphere, the busiest suburban station in Australia, the longest platform, blah, 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 blah. It's not bad, is it? Although it does look a bit weird. There's this story that Bombay Railway Station's plans and Flinders Street's plans got muddled up and the Indians ended up with the real Flinders Streets and the Australians got this one. I doubt whether that can be true, but the thing I like about it most is the clocks. Everyone says, I'll meet you under the clocks at Flinders Street. I just like them. I love them, really. And there was actually a plan in the 1980s to get rid of them and replace them with screens. I'm glad that brilliant idea never came to fruition. Really? You've got to look at these. Aren't they fantastic? And, and all of these over here. And this one, can I take that test? Thank you. Pretty good, yeah? Except I haven't actually brought you here to talk about hats. I brought you here to talk about these things, hat pins. Because in the years leading up to the First World War, the men of Melbourne were terrified of them. Tess, can you demonstrate to us what was going on? See that there? We are the worst two people in the world to be able to demonstrate this because you are much taller than me. But you can imagine, if I'm brushing past Tess, as you might, whack, you get that in your face. In fact, Tess, OK, you can stand up now. There are stories, aren't there? Horrendous stories of a, a little kid at a football match who got gashed from there right through to there by a hat pin, somebody else right through the mouth, another man going through the turnstiles of a railway station. It went through his nose. Horrible, horrible things. So, in the end, Melbourne City Council passed a law that said if you were going out with a hat pin, you had to have one of these little metal caps on the top of it. So the carnage was considerably reduced. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. After the act had been passed, the police used to prowl these streets looking for women with pointy hat pins. And if they found any, they were carted off. In fact, one afternoon in the courthouse in Peran, six women were found guilty, and one of them fainted when she was fined two and six. Serves all right. A few blocks down from Artie Graffati Hosier Lane, where we started our walk, 
Once, all the alleys along Flinders Lane were dominated by the city's rag trade. Factories and showrooms churning out garments for fashion-conscious Melburnians. But these days, they're filled with devout worshippers of the coffee bean. Isn't this amazing? Could be Paris, Naples, Rome. Just so European. Although, interestingly, in the 1890s, right here, I'd have been sitting on a lavatory because all up there, there were rows and rows of urinals for the local workers. Cheers. Cummings Alley may have been lined with laths, but 150 years ago, visitors to Melbourne expected to find the streets paved with gold. The gold rush had an incredible impact on Melbourne. Money flooded in, and this tiny little frontier town was completely transformed. Even some of the little lanes had glass roofs fixed on top of them and became boutique shopping malls. By the 1880s, Melbourne was one of the richest cities in the entire world. Under this roof was one of Melbourne's biggest attractions of the age. In here was the world's largest bookstore, a million books all housed under glass and iron. And this was at a time when Melbourne had less than a million inhabitants. But it was the bloke who owned the store that really fascinates me. His name was E.W. Cole, and he was one of those typical late 19th century Victorian eccentrics. He was passionate, he was utopian, he was deeply political. Fascinating bloke who owned an even more fascinating store. Lisa, you probably know more about coal than anybody. How big was this bookshop? Oh, it was huge. It stretched all the way from Burke Street two blocks back to Collins Street. Why did he need so much space? <laughs> well, he didn't only have books, you know. He had a Chinese tea salon, he had a fernery filled with birds, he had monkeys, a brass band, Indian hawkers, optical illusions, a hall of mirrors. So it was show business just yeah, as much as it, it was, was like book a carnival, selling. Absolutely. Idealists don't usually make very good businessmen, do they? <laughs> no, they don't. It was quite unusual in that way. What are these gorgeous little things? These are little medals or tokens that he had made up and they have utopian slogans written across them. And he'd scatter them in the streets and people would pick them up and take them to the arcade and they could exchange them for a pencil. But a lot of people actually kept them and collected them as well. This has got to be my favourite, Cole's Funny Picture Book. What's this all about? Uh, this is a bizarre mix of things. It's like a scrapbook in a way. It's a child's amuser. I'd have loved one of these. Every page is a treasure, isn't it? Doggy drawing pussy's likeness. <laughs> I love this. Prophecies for the year 2000. Flying machines will be in general use, passing and repassing every point on Earth. We got that one right, didn't yes. we? I think these are rather good. They've been hidden for too long. I think it's time E.W. Cole's words were heard again on the streets of Melbourne, don't you? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, after 120 years, it's time that the words of E.W. Cole were heard again here, right in front of his bookshop. A network of railways, telegraphs, telephones will cover the entire Earth, allowing people to fraternise throughout the Earth. He prophesied that in the year 1880. The land of the world will become the property of all the people of the world. Has that happened? <laughs> the world will be federated in politics, in religion and in language, and men will wonder why they were fools so long. Do you wonder why you were fools for so long? Yes! <laughs> when you should. Thank you for your help. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Oh, I love playing to a crowd. So, still think Melbourne's a nice, refined city? Well, with all these underground artists, naked ladies and killer hatpins, I'm not sure if I'm coming or going. Mind you, it wouldn't be the first time. Excuse me. Hello, uh, mate. Can you tell me Chinatown? Is? Chinatown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Turn around this direction, go back to the next set of lights. 
on your right hand side, you're in it. Is it a very old Chinatown? Has it been here long? It's actually the oldest sequentially running Chinatown in the world. What does sequentially mean? In a row. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was founded around about the mid 1800s. Yeah. And what happened, the San Francisco one, I believe, actually started before it, but it was hit by the earthquake, so it had to stop. Whereas this one's actually been running continuously since I think it was 1851 or something like that. No, I, I don't want to be too punchy about this, <laughs> but this is another example of Melbourne being second best, isn't it? Well, I think the latest survey was that we did just beat Vancouver and we were the best. So, you know, check your facts there. And you're not second best to Sydney by any chance? Oh, don't start me. All right, don't start. I'm in uniform, all right? I can't really say about the rivalry between Sydney and Melbourne, all right? Yeah, cheers, mate. Enjoy your time. I just had to make Chinatown part of my walk, but not because I'm hungry. One of my favourite things on this whole walk, it's only tiny, but it's right up here. Look, a street sign? So what? It's just a street sign. Another street sign? What does it say? The fairest universe is but a heap of rubbish piled up at random. Profound and very humbling. A block over from Chinatown is a forgotten corner of the city known as Little Lon. Why did I choose to include a lonely commercial sector, you might ask? And the answer is... This was known as the dirtiest, most disreputable part of Melbourne. And from the 1850s onwards, it was the red light district. Why here rather than somewhere else? Well, you've got Parliament House over there, you've got the exotic Chinatown down there, and the theory goes that it was all the politicians who came creeping down here for a bit of rumpy-pumpy that kept this place in profit for decade after decade. There's even a story that there was a tunnel from Parliament all the way down here. And though that may not be true, it's certainly the case that the politicians could phone up and book whatever it was that they were after, because the high-class brothels around here were some of the first places in Melbourne to install telephone lines, which is why prostitutes became known as cool girls. And I bet you didn't know that. It's been a while since Little Non was a hotbed of, well, hotbeds. The only thing being rented out here now are offices. So you see, people are still being screwed. Oh, careful, careful. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, hang on. The, uh, easy, easy, it's all right, mate. <laughs> the, uh, the character may have gone out of the area, but there's still a lot of characters here. What's going on? Just having a few photos for old time's sake, Tony, and getting all the gang back together again. Bring back a few memories. Memories of what? Um, our youth, misspent youth, Tony, Sharpies. OK, time for a quick 70s subculture flashback. This is what Melbourne's Sharpies looked like then, complete with natty threads. And this is what they look like now. Well, at least the clothing's the same. You had to be wearing the right clothes, the right cardigan, all done up, shoes polished, and it was our own individual style, which was totally Melbourne. It was a real working class man's thing, the yeah. sharp dress. It wasn't a middle class thing. It was all part of the attitude and the swag of the walk. Did you walk with a bit of a strut? The more strut, the better. Yeah, yeah well, show us the strut. Hey, Larry. Go on, Larry. Oh, I bet you uh, what. Okay, what do we know about sharpies? One, they like to dress up. Two, they give good strut. Although, given the passing years, I think it's easier if we stick to walking. Less strenuous. So, what else do Sharpies like doing? Well, I'll give you a clue. Oh, oh gosh, you're a brilliant. <laughs> I feel like I'm a gang member now, I really do. <laughs> you have to have one of the cardigans. Oh, oh wow. yes, yes, thank you. I won't tell them I used to be a mod, they'll kill me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and by the finish. <laughs> the sweet old Sharpie right, traditions. Mate, you're right. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> that was a real laugh. <laughs> Terrific blokes, but imagine what they would have been like 40 years ago if you'd walked into that pub and seen them like that. A bit scary. Mm. 
Next stop, a block further along Spring Street, is Parliament House for a bit of civic agitation. The year is 1992 and the state of Victoria is in political turmoil. The Labour Party have been in power for some time, but then the Liberals sweep in on a landslide with a, a new Premier, Jeff Kennett, who promises to cut costs, which of course is a very popular policy, except that cutting costs means cutting jobs, and he set about it with a will. 55 schools were slashed, 4,000 teaching posts went, tens of thousands of people were made redundant. The state didn't know what had hit it. And then, on the 10th of November, 800,000 people stopped work in protest. The papers were full of pictures of the demonstration that took place right here, 100,000 strong. But while all this chaos was going here, something quite different was happening about 10 feet up, just round the corner. The next building along is St Patrick's Cathedral, which is, incidentally, the tallest church in Australia. And at the time, there was a renovation going on, and there were loads of guys up the scaffolding, just like there are today. Chaps, is it all right if I come up? Yeah, no worries, mate. Come on up. Thank you. Ooh. I thought my journey along the lanes was going to be horizontal, not vertical. Anyway, here now. I'm up, guys. So, one of the people who was working up here at the time was a stonemason, and his name was Tom Carson. And he was renovating the gargoyles. And he decided, at his own private little demo, to recarve this gargoyle with the face of the hated Premier. Now, I know this was part of the tradition going back to the Middle Ages, whereby you would recreate gargoyles with the faces of local celebrities. So I think old Jeff. He may have pretended to be upset by it, but I should think he was really rather pleased. I mean, his face is there for, what, the next three, four, five hundred years. He really is a celebrity, even though he was loathed at the time. I've saved the best for last, so I hope you don't mind if I backtrack from the cathedral, across Spring Street, and into another one of those curious Melbourne back streets. This lane's called Myers Place, and it's the home to one of the city's great culinary establishments, the Waiters Club. It started in 1947, and in the early days, you needed a password to get up those stairs. It's pretty quiet now, isn't it? But one night, all hell broke loose. Just past midnight on March 31st, 1978, a young tearaway named Amos Atkinson came stumbling up these stairs. He was about 18 years old. He'd been through the criminal justice system. He'd been drinking with his mates. He was in a car, got out a shotgun, bang, 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 at the old coppers. There's a big chase. Ends up here. They're downstairs. Amos bursts in. It's a real siege situation. And Clive, you were actually here on that night, weren't you? I was here on that night. I've been to a box party and Amos burst in through the door. He ordered everyone to the floor yeah. the mids. Tables being turned upside down, yeah. glass of wine, the whole lot. Spaghetti. Spaghetti, plenty of spaghetti. And could I borrow just a little bit of your spaghetti <laughs> for a moment? Spaghetti. So you're falling yeah, to the floor, off you all, go. We've all dived for the floor. That's it. And the ones who weren't crawling were hiding? Yeah, a few of them ran to the toilet. Yeah. If you could just run to the toilet. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Amos made three demands of the coppers. He said, first of all, he wanted his old childhood hero, Chopper Reed, freed from prison. Secondly, he said he wanted to speak to his brother, Mervyn, who was training to be in the police. And thirdly, he said he wanted to talk to his mum, which is rather sweet, really, isn't it? So things are really going quite well at this moment. But then, he suddenly realises that all the people have sneaked off and must have been hiding in the toilet. So he calls them all in again. Come out of the toilet! <laughs> the, you imagine what a shock Amos had, because there were 13 people all hidden in the toilet. So all that must have been pretty terrifying, but oh, your yeah. mates were trying to affect a break-in, weren't they? Uh, they climbed up over the roof through the Winter Hotel and uh, uh, 
in order to try and rescue us um, and ran into the special operations group. So that it was just... brave and noble, but yes, actually exactly. no good yes. whatsoever. They had a good night. But <laughs> at that moment, may I borrow your bag? At that moment, who should come in but Amos's mum, dressed, believe it or not, in her dressing gown and her tracksuit trousers. And she grabs hold of her little boy Amos and she says to him, I only ask you to do one thing and you mess that up, don't you? And poor old Amos is so cowed, he releases all the hostages, he gets carted off and he gets five years in prison. And while he was in there, he did something in tribute to his great hero, Chopper Reed, who'd done the same thing. He chopped his own ears off. Poor little lad. Oh, have your bag back. Night night. So it's taken me about half a day and a bit over four kilometres. But I reckon that was a pretty tasty walk, don't you? And I never even got round to seeing the parliamentary tunnels and the ghost of the Princess Theatre and the vertical laneways that go up rather than along that way, which is pretty weird, you've got to admit. But you could have a look. Why don't you try it sometime? 